All right, in this lecture, we're talking about discrete Fourier transform. Discrete Fourier transform. So, so here we will talk about the discrete Fourier transform, DFT. Well, let me try to refresh your memory by reminding you about the fact that we can express any periodic function in the exponential form. And basically, it's a, a, a periodic function, f of t, can be expressed in the exponential form e raised to the power e i, I k omega naught t and multiply with a unknown complex number c tilde k as shown earlier in equation 26 that I repeated in here. The unknown complex number c tilde k can be given according to equation 28 that I mentioned to you earlier that I repeated here. Uh, notice there's a, a few difference between the equation 26 and equation 28. In equation 26, as you can see, the power of the exponential e raised to the power actually positive i k omega naught t, whereas in equation 28, the power of e is negative i k omega naught t. Another thing you have to recognize is in equation 26, you don't have a factor in the front, but here in equation 28, you have a factor of 1 over t. All right. So any periodic function f of t can be expressed in terms of the power, exponential e raised to the power, with the unknown c tilde k. And that unknown c tilde k complex number can be computed based on equation 28. Now suppose the time t is discretized at some specific location. So for example, time t is equal to t1. Let's say t1 equal to delta t. Delta t is the defined value by the user. And let's say t2 is defined as 2 times delta t. Similarly, t3 we define as 3 delta t. So based on that, we can say, in general, t sub n is equal to n times delta t. So if you discretize the time t according to that manner, then equation 26 will be modified as shown in equation 1, right here in equation 1. As a matter of fact, if you look back into equation 26, you see, when you discretize the time t, instead of calling t, now you just call it t sub n. Instead of calling t, you call it t sub n, where the value of t sub n could be equal to delta t, or 2 delta t, or 3 delta t, or n times delta t. It could be at any time, discretized time. So by letting t to become t sub n, then equation 26 over there can be expressed as shown in equation 1. You see, in equation 1, instead of t, we just say t sub n. Instead of t, we just say t sub n. So that is what we have so far. The next thing we have, which we say, is this. To simplify the notation further, instead of saying the time t sub n, we just simply say t sub n is equal to n. That's what equation 2 say. So this is just like a, a convenient notation. Now please do not confuse, all right? Because somebody may ask me, you say, hey, why? n is an integer, but t sub n could be any time, like a like a real number. How can it be true? Well, the way we interpret is n is just like an index counter. If you know the index counter n, let's say n equal to 4, then t4 means 
it is equal to 4 times delta t. If n is equal to, let's say, 6, then t sub 6 is equal to n, and t sub 6 is equal to 6 times delta t. So n, you just think like an index, index counter. It's an integer, but t sub n, it could be a particular, any particular real number. Okay, so with that notation, then the previous equation, instead of writing t sub n, we just write out as n. And then on the right hand side, instead of t sub n, we just write out as n. So the formula now becomes a little bit simpler. Now, the next thing we say is, from equation 3, we can to multiply both sides of equation 3 by this term, e raised to the power minus i l omega naught n. And then after that, we do the summation on the index n. Let's see what happens. Well, when you multiply both sides by, let's say, e raised to the power minus i time l omega naught time n, we also multiply both sides by the same amount, minus i l omega 0 n, and then do the summation on n. That means you do the summation here on n, and you also do the summation here on n. Then, equation 3 that you see on the computer screen right here will become something like I show you in equation 4. You see? Remember I told you? You multiply both sides by e raised to that power minus i l omega 0 n and then after that you do the summation both sides with the index n. You see? That is why you got equation 4. Now, the next thing we can say is this. E raised to the power i k omega 0 n times e raised to the power minus i l omega 0 n. These two terms or the product you can combine together. And that is shown in equation 5 right there. Right? And I hope you remember the reason is because, for example, you have e raised to the power, let's say a, if you multiply that with e raised to the power b, the answer will be e raised to the power a plus b. And so to go from here to there, basically, you just make use of this simple relationship. Okay. So now, we already have equation 5. On the left-hand side, summation on n, fn times e raised to the power minus i l omega 0 n. And on the right-hand side, as I indicated in equation 5. Now, the next thing we can do is we want to swap or switch the order of summation on the right-hand side of equation 5. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, instead of doing the summation on n first, and then do the summation on k, we swap these two summation side. So we'll do the summation on k first. When that is the case, then you can see the summation on k, you do it first. And then after that, you do the summation on n like I told you. Now obviously, because the complex number C tilde K related to the index K, and that's why that can be moved outside to corresponding to the summation of K. So that is why we got equation 6. Now, at this point, what I want to do will be 
let's try to consider the inner summation. For example, I want to consider this inner summation first. That inner summation, we call it is equal to A. We call it equal to A because we define A is exactly equal to that inner summation based on equation number seven. So now, based on that, you can see on the right hand side of equation six, basically we have, let's see, equal summation on K of C tilde K and then time the inner summation. But that inner summation, we define it as capital A. Right? So th that's all we did. The inner summation shown in equation 6, we call it equal to capital A. Now, how do we calculate?